So good afternoon, everyone. First, welcome to Unapologetically Black. Whether you are black, brown, light skinned, light skinned it, Native American, mixed, Hispanic, Indian, from India, woke white people, West Indian, Africana, live it, breathe it, learn it, teach it, feel it, spread it, be it, here on the Square Media Network. I am Luana Mayfield, your host. Please forgive us for our delay along with a little bit of traffic getting from Charlotte into where we are today. Spectrum, unfortunately, was having some challenges because there was an accident. So for those of you that stuck around, thank you so much for it. I am so proud and honored for our third show to welcome Miss Lena J. Welcome to Unapologetically Black. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. This is going to be good. So, Lena, here's where I want us to start. Okay. First of all, I have this beautiful art up here behind us because you are a character artist. And I don't think a lot of people even think about African-Americans, much, much less black women that are in character art. So tell us a little bit about who you are where did you matriculate if you graduated from college? Why did you find a love in character art? Well, let's see. Okay. Started a long time ago. I was a daughter of a sharecropper. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. I need to retire that joke. Um, I've been drawing since I was three years old. Um, my father is an artist, and he was the first one from you know that I watched as a child. Um, I've always gravitated towards wanting to be a cartoonist. And the thing is, I am a painter, I am an illustrator, I'm actually a self-published author really? and an art teacher. I think I covered them all. Um, so I go between fine art as well as commercial art, but my, my cash cow, my, my love, my joy is being a cartoonist. It's the thing that, um, that pays my bills and gives me an extreme amount of joy. Um, People have said before, you ever thought about going into architecture or fashion? Mm -hmm. It's not about the money. Really? Um, I, yeah, I would do this for free. Because a lot of people think everything should be about the money. So that's why I'm glad and that the you mentioned that. the people. Really? That's what I think. Okay. I, um, if you're not loving what you're doing, there needs to be some type of outlet that you're getting to bring you joy. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate to have that be one and the same. My job as well as... Um, the thing that, that gives me a lot of pleasure. Uh, let's see. And um, I am an HBCU alum, um, stand up Winston-Salem State University, um, freshman class of 89, graduating class of 94. And um, I've been working as a cartoonist now for over 26 years. 26 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if those of you that are watching, you see that I, one, am technically challenged. So I was trying to pull up this beautiful collage oh. that you have created of different celebrities from political arenas. Tell me how you pull politics into your art. You know, it wasn't my intention in the beginning. Um, my inspiration as a child came from Mad Magazine, and I love to see the way that they would parody um, different TV shows and movies, but they didn't really touch politics. Mm. Um, for me, I've got to be honest, it was one of those things where, back to what I said about doing it and not worrying about the money. Mm -hmm. Around the time that President Obama first started running, that's when I started thinking, okay, I'm not the one to canvas the neighborhood, although I have done that before, but I've got to be a part of this conversation. Political cartoons, social cartoons allows me to be a part of what's going on. I may not be able to change minds necessarily um, in the most direct way, but at least it will um, it, it elicit some sort of like re response or um, an uh, an opinion of, of, of sorts um, and even if um, it's just me and no one else has seen it I get some comfort in seeing something going on and sort of channeling how I feel about it into my work so 
I'm going to do a little bit of host privilege because we met because of your art. So we have a mutual friend. Kanika Drayford, yes. who Kanika and I have known each other now more than a decade, thanks to my spouse. They have been best friends for 30 plus years, and before us interacting on social media, you and I were introduced because of Kanika, and I have become a major fan of your work because you Thank changed you. the conversation and I know I've had to call on you because we had a local I guess Kevin Sears is considered a cartoonist. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I say names on this show because <laughs> um, y'all need to know who we're talking about. So when you read The Observer and other pa papers and things, there's a satire piece that's done and there was one that was extremely unflattering but it's just all of the least. all of the all of his are very unflattering for whoever it is and i reached out to you and you created as people and i'm going to run back through this video one more time because i want people to see how you capture us oh do you have the one that um with you that i have I'm quite sure I do. Now, since I'm since I'm technologically um, challenged over here, I'm going to try to figure out if I can find it. <laughs> okay. And because you did send it to us, but even when people look at what how you have done, even with this one, uh, Jesse Smollett, and everything that went on yeah. with that whole conversation and uh, your comments of it is better to risk saving a guilty person than to condemn an innocent one. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. That would be, um, I believe, Moliere. And I thought that was a fantastic quote to fit his situation. It wasn't about whether um, his crime was... Oh, God, where do I start? You know, in the court of public opinion, it was about him being a celebrity. Right. A lot of people were mad to begin with that. Let's just right. start black or white. They were so united in how dare you. And there were so you. many holes in that story. Right. So the fact that you have individuals that say, well, he paid me to do this. Well, the law enforcement had done their job. They clearly saw checks was writ were written months prior, and they clearly were for workouts and for fitness related. And in 2019, when so many LGBTQ people are attacked on a daily basis. You saw a lot of the community that reached out and support and sending him love. And you also had a lot of people who condemned him and didn't want to believe. See, I was of two minds about it. Because on one hand, I looked at it like, you know, until innocent until proven guilty. Right. And so at least I guess, that's unless you're black. Right, right. Well, that's a whole right. Well, that's a different that conversation. A but, but this is how I looked at it. I didn't know whether he was right or wrong, and I did care. But what I did know was that um, until we had absolute proof, you know, I was get, I was growing tired of all of the the, the, the vitriol, all the the venom that people were spitting out mm -hmm. about him, and they brought the LGBTQ thing into it. It wasn't just um, this is a celebrity taking advantage of our our love of the TV show he's on, it became it became about nicknames like Juicy Smollett, making fun of him. Um, right. That's when I took umbrage because I was like, you're going into another area now. You're attacking him about his sexual orientation and not about whether he committed a crime. So for me, I'm like, let me just put this out there. This is where I stand. I'm not gullible. You know, I'm not um, necessarily like caping for him or anything, mm -hmm. but I also don't want to see, I'm just going to be honest with you, uh, a black man go to jail for something that, in the big scheme of things, he lied. And, and for me, there still isn't proof to me that he lied. So, if that's the worst, worst, but yet we have a young black male now who's actually doing jail, about to do jail time because of kissing a 17 year old white girl in a 21 and over club. Now, both of y'all were underage. 
the club is not being mentioned for having any liability for letting people underage be in there. But in 2019, you have a young black male who's getting ready to serve time for kissing a white girl. So when you look at the hypocrisy Mm -hmm. in what we have to look at as our judicial system and our so-called justice system and the lack of justice that happens more often than not, as far as this particular case, that's between him and God. If he was attacked, I still sending out prayers for healing for him with so many in the LGBTQ community. So many of our trans sisters are being murdered without there ever being any solution, any finding of the assailant. Even you had a recently two young trans women, two trans women of color, specifically black trans women, who were attacked publicly with people having their phones out and everything else. And I'm like, the fact that one of them, people stood around and watched as if this was entertainment for them. Who are we becoming as a nation? Gosh, um, I I have a lot of things to say on that. Um, I'm not even sure where to begin. Um, We're desensitized. We are. I mean, that's the obvious one. Um, It's it's beginning to feel a little bit like um, something uh, Roman era where like the the rich and the wealthy watch the weak fight it out in the in the arena. We are There's, living Hunger Games. Right, right. I mean, it, insert any of those. Um, uh, what's the one with? Um, um, I can't think of it right now. But um, uh, Game of Thrones, for example. Right. And but I want to get back to something that you said. It, it's been in the back of my mind. The Kevin Sears cartoon. Yes. There's something I want to address about that. Not personally about him, but a, about the way that Caucasian artists sometimes see us. Yes. This is another reason why I feel so strongly about getting my work out there. Because if you do a Google search for Maxine Waters, yes. Do a Google search for Serena Williams. Do a Google search for Michelle Obama and put under it um, art or cartoons, you will see the most hideous, unflattering cartoons you've ever seen. Exactly. And I, I don't know who's worse because as beautiful as Michelle Obama is, I've seen cartoonists who've managed to make her look monstrous. Um, I remember once seeing one with Halle Berry where I was thinking, what do you ugly up on Halle Berry? Exactly. I mean, this, 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 is, a, a, this is a reach if there ever was one. When I saw the cartoon that the guy did of you, um, you know, it, it didn't surprise me. You know, it was my, my pleasure to to draw it my way and, you know, to present you as the beautiful, confident woman that you are. So why y'all looking? See that pretty picture of me? <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of many. This is not the the photo the character art that was created for that particular conversation but there is a difference in how we capture specifically people of color and how media since the beginning of the creation of film and television how they've always tried to depict anyone other than white the lens is always distorted sometimes it's actually and I'm not giving a pass, but genuinely, it, it, it's it's not personal. It's just... Oh, yeah, I don't think a lot it, of it is. And then sometimes it is. Um, I've never been the type of artist to go for the jugular anyway, um, no matter who the subject was. Even with Trump, I remember my earlier caricatures of him, people were like, you didn't make him ugly enough. You didn't make him orange enough. You didn't make him fat enough. And I was like, I need it to still look like him. But, you know, I didn't lampoon him to death. I just wanted to bring out the things that I thought were the most obvious. Right. The tan skin, um, the look of white privilege that seems to like seep through his pores, you know, um, the smug look on his face. Right. Those were the things I was after. I wasn't trying to make him like a monster. But when it comes to African Americans, particularly African American women, um, you know, not to 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 um to keep harping on a topic but whether we're looking at tv shows movies and even art there's always this 
view of us that is that is um we have to fight for flattering images even in yes. 2019 it, it does frustrate me that i'm still seeing things like that and i think the other challenge is when we are the attackers in our own community we are the harshest we as people of it. color as black people we but it's not just black people it's all when you think about the fact that we all have internalized what media says is beauty you can watch a telenovela and you will still see the same thing you will see that latino with blonde hair and with fairer skin versus darker skin if you travel travel to the caribbean all they have on television is still that fair skin, blonde hair, very slim with very little curves. Myth. It is that, which is why you think of Sofia Vergara and why she's so beloved because she is curvy. She is thick. She is. She has a heavy accent. She is proud of her heritage she's and a walks light through it. Latina compared to some of the darker ones like uh, Lauren Velez yes who has more of a mocha brown complexion I um, not to, to switch the subject to that but um, I see that plight too with 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 other races you know here's my thing with um, with African Americans I challenge us all to look beyond just our plight right that's the thing that gets me I remember when the movie Us came out. Mm -hmm. There was a discussion going on about the character that um, that Lupita played. She purposely chose to modify her voice to sound like uh, an actual condition that people have, where um, there's some sort of it's it's a speech disorder. Right. And the people who have that disorder were offended. Were offended. And here's the part that bothered me. I saw in a few chat rooms some of the same black folks who want to like get out the pitchforks and torches whenever there's something that depicts us in an unflattering way could not find one ounce of compassion for people who have that disorder and how that may make them feel you know it made me want to cry actually because i thought what if that's how i spoke right. and the one time that you see it being um displayed it's for a character who's a villain or that's in sort of a, mm. a, a villainous role or a monstrous role, an unflattering role. The character, you know, not to give away spoilers, but if you know anything about, you know, that movie, you know that that character is supposed to be, um, she's a troubled character. Oh. You know, so. And see, I, and I, for full transparency, I did not watch I have not seen the movie, this part-time job that I do. That's a full-time job, full-time, part-time pay job. You're going to get you. <laughs> That's a, that full-time, <laughs> part-time pay job that I do called uh, public service. I don't get as much time to the movies as I would like. But I, I did catch an interview where she talked about it. And for me, I'm glad you shared what you just shared because the way that I looked at it is, we created a conversation that's never been held before. Exactly. So she gave some background, not only on the fact that some identify as a disorder, but she actually gave some shared information for people to go and do more research on their own. And I never heard of it before. Right. And so that opened up a conversation. And I think it's almost it's to the place where we have to think about, can we take these instances as opportunities can we use it as an opportunity to see and do something different so even though i might not care for the person that's in the white house right now he has started conversations that are long overdue regarding ripped the race. Off. he ripped, the he ripped it off. right off for those who had to that felt they had to be politically correct for so long he's given them carte blanche to be exactly who they've always been no. and i would much rather know yeah who yeah. you are than to not know and to be in that position thinking that you care or there's some genuine concern or there's a genuine a genuine relationship that we're building but it isn't so he opened the door for us to have a very different conversation 
the question is, what are we going to do on the other side of it? And when I think about your art, when I think about how you use your art and how you address different societal concerns and the norms and what unfortunately has become the norm, that's where I think we have a real opportunity to flip this conversation. Like you said, where is our compassion? How do we change that conversation to have a different understanding of the other person's point of view? You use your platform wisely. In this day and age, and you know, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was um, 1984, um, George Orwell. Um, no, Andy Warhol. Okay. In the future, everybody will have their 15 minutes of fame. Right. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, it was, Andy, it was Andy Warhol. And with that, we have social media. Mm -hmm. That is our platform to be famous. And you know, everybody doesn't get to go from Twitter or YouTube to um, stardom like an Issa Rae. Right. However, um, you know, we've all seen Facebook stars and Twitter stars and people who have these followers, Instagram models and all that. Of which I still not understand it, but in essence, that's what we're doing right now. We're on a YouTube channel. We're doing a podcast exactly. with the hope of educating people, but with the greater hope that people will tune in to learn something new, something different. Yet, the end of the day, it is about likes and clicks and shares. We have become that nation when you think about Black Mirror. And oh, you think yes, about show. the episode, what was it, season three of Black yes, Mirror? Yes, it was uh, Howard, um, Ron Howard's daughter. So when she, her life in a 72-hour period yeah. completely went down because everything in that society was based on how you interacted and how other people rated you, of which they're already doing that in China. Bryce Dallas Howard. And I remember that episode. I had such conflicted feelings at the end of it because if you you know not to get off on black mirror but if you are a fan of the show you know they don't give you pretty endings no it's a rare one when, when they do so you're left with I don't that know, feeling i don't know i like that last i like black museum that oh, was a pretty ending that to me, one but. But, yeah fist bump <laughs> on that one i watched that one again like back to back right. that's how much i enjoyed right. it then i got to see her again in black panther right Exactly. Um, shouts out to her. But, yeah, um, the platform thing, I take it very seriously. You know, I hear a lot of people say things like, it's just Facebook. It's just Twitter. Anytime you consider that a president, CNN, has been able to rely on social media to get their message across. And right. Obama gets credit for being the first president to really use social media to his benefit. And then we're seeing the clear, the mirror of how our president can use social media every to, day but how it was used for good and now how it can easily be used for evil absolutely and how you can practically start a war from twitter and how the stock market has fluctuated because of a twitter post when you look at the impact of social media today the idea when social media was first being created was really the 70s we give credit to zuckerberg and others but it was really 70s where you had the greatest minds when they were in college coming together and playing around with this mm -hmm. playing around with computers remember when we had the right. giant like the young people today have no idea how big a computer used to be out that we can have this <laughs> how we have laptops today and how we got to this point how we've evolved to laptops i mean i think about even when you think of music, we do everything on our phones now. You have your music, you have everything. Well, let's go back to Star Trek with the flip phone. So you have all of these examples, but there was always this thought that it would bring us closer together. And to an extent it has, but there's also the recognition that we are more disconnected as people, as human beings, as neighbors, as family. That Preach. apathy that yeah. we have 
we don't want to talk on the telephone anymore. We would rather have it in a text. We're so dis we become so disconnected from each other that you now have businesses that have been created to cuddle. You have businesses. I saw that. Right. You have businesses so kind of crazy. created <laughs> for you to go on dates, not on for it to be a physical relationship or a hookup, but just because you're in such great need for human companionship, of which Octavia Butler called for it years ago. Okay. Yes, I okay. have all of her okay. books that may she continue to rest in heaven. Hello, Kendra. So when we Hello. think <laughs> of all of the warnings that were given to us and we look at how social media is used today and we look at how social media can be used as such a vile tool and we look at our children and our children are committing suicide because of cyberbullying and then you have school systems that say well this didn't happen on school grounds we don't have any control over cyberspace Wait a minute, let's rethink that. Because the timeline of everything is on social media. So you see that they sit in their little bad butts up in class on the phone, sending out all these horrific messages telling their peers to kill themselves and these other things. So why would you not take responsibility for the fact that, yeah, you can do something within the school system because it's happening on school grounds, but it's affecting them when they leave the school. Let me tell you about some recent projects I've been um, blessed to be a part of. Um, now that you've mentioned children, um, and being a mother of two, um, it affects me directly. Um, as well as an art teacher, I'm constantly around little people. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been fortunate to work on two projects that I've been calling my Black Girl Magic projects. Nice. One of them actually deals with bullying. Okay. And the more I get into those characters uh, created by a new author, Amy George, um, the more excited I am about the story that she's telling from a young black girl's point of view and what it's like to be, um, to not want to go to school mm. because in the past, it was just someone talking about you in the hallway. Now it's someone taking a cell phone and taking a picture of your clothes because they don't think that you match up to what they're wearing. And imagine that person sends a tweet out or an Instagram post. I can't believe she's wearing this. Right. So I applaud you know, the author for taking, taking that on. It's called Stormy Days. It'll be out um, this year. Okay. And I'm... Uh, very excited about that. So pay attention, people, because if you have young people in your life, whether they're your children, your nieces, your nephews, then be on the lookout for Stormy. Stormy Days. Stormy Days. By, um, by Amy Georges. And um, it, like I said, it's from um, the point of view of a young black girl, middle school age, who's, um, she's, um, they just, um, they pick on her. And, and it's her breakthrough, how she gets through that, how she finds her special powers. Um, the second book would be Pigtails, the second book, um, and that's by um, uh, Daryl McCollum and mm -hmm. Jamie, um, Jamie, Jamie Lynn Brown. And I've already done one book, uh, Pigtails, um, Autumn Adventures. That one was so successful that they sold copies in Soweto, South Africa, wow. as well as Kuwait. Um, so you've done all of the art mm -hmm. for the books. Right. They're the authors, wow. um, Flowing Waters Publication, uh, Jamie and Daryl, and I'm the illustrator. Okay. Um, now, I've done quite a few books over the years, but I've got to be honest, certain ones, they, you know, um, they're attached to the heart, mm -hmm. you know. So for me, there's something about dealing with um, anything that, puts more images of, of, of brown faces out there because you would be surprised how um, many children's books for Afri that are aimed at African American children one, usually deal with the same subject matter over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's either something historical mm -hmm. where it's like the early days of um, I don't know um, uh, Obama or uh, Dr. George King, Carver, Dr. Rosa King, Parks. Rosa Parks. Yeah, the struggle, right? Um, or it's something dealing with um, a current theme has been loving your hair. Okay, and we need those books. We need them, especially when you just recently had a 
city that had to pass legislation yeah. for yo to say it's okay to have your natural Girl. hair. I'm like 2019. I my locks what is that. wrong <laughs> with these people? So that is wonderful to know. I met this young woman. She's 12 years old. Miosha's world. So for those of you who don't already know, she is an amazing young woman. She has you. her own Instagram page. She's a clothing designer. Again, at 12, she's wow. worked with a number of celebrities. She w is working now on a big project for a anti-bullying slash oh. gun violence event that God has blessed us to meet. And I'm able to help do some connections for her. One of the things that from meeting with her that is going to stick with me for the rest of the time God gives me on this earth. The whole reason she started her journey and is now an entrepreneur and an activist is because a family member who was five years old, five, I'm not fifth myself. grade, five years old, was bullied so bad that she attempted suicide once. The bullying continued and actually became even worse because of social media and other things that she attempted suicide again in a much more attempting to be permanent way and at five years old. I can't wrap my head around that. Exactly. What type of problem do you have with a five-year-old? Kids are so freaking cruel that it's ridiculous. And let's go back. We've taken discipline out. Now, there's a big difference between discipline and abuse. Okay. I'm not talking about abusing your child. Agreed. But a lot of these young people walk around, they have absolutely no respect for their parents. Yeah. They have no respect for the teachers. They have no respect for authority. You go, you see the social media posts where kids are in I've the classroom, me. standing on top of the desk, cursing out the teachers. Teachers can't I've break up fights. Videos. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to break up fights anymore, but you want to put a gun in a teacher's hand. Like, okay, that's a whole nother level of conversation. But mm -hmm. you can't break up fights. They get to talk to you any kind of way. Students get to hit teachers. When I grew up, you ain't did that nonsense. Girl, you did not. You ain't, you knew. You you didn't cut your eyes the wrong way because you risked the chance of that old saying, you're going to be picking your eyes up off the floor. I have to tell you, I went to here in Charlotte, Our Lady of Consolation. Catholic Church. It was at one point the only private black Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, but I lived in fear of those nuns because they didn't play. And so I was raised old school with the ruler across the knuckles. There was even Ooh, I've um, heard about that. a myth of a spanking machine that <laughs> I'm, I'm not. It, O-L-O-C -O um, alums, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we lived in fear of the spanking machine. It turned out to be a nun with a ruler. But but the point is, um, uh, it kept us in line. And honestly, they didn't have to tell us that we're going to hit us. We did not dare disrespect them. Now, in my classroom, when I work with, I work with the Great Enrichment Program here in Charlotte. I love the Great Enrichment Program. Many years ago. So that playground that they have, yeah, I helped to build that. Oh, and wow. Matt, me and the head of PNC Bank were on the mulch patrol. Never knew how heavy mulch can be when you're throwing it, when you're shoveling it into a tarp oh. and having to move it from point A to point B. Girl, I was sore four days after that. I mean, it was a beautiful experience, but I I'm was never going to look at that area again <laughs> the same way. I mean, blood, sweat, and tears. It, that is, they they have an amazing program that's been doing over work. Over 40 years. For over 40 years. Shout helping to, children. Uh, George, George uh, Bishop Battle. Bishop Battle did, uh, the, he did a wonderful thing with Greater Enrichment Program. But I got to I gotta tell you um the thing about the great enrichment program um they provide excellent programs for their young people you know um bronica glover um miss tan all everybody that's over there doing a wonderful job but they don't play right. i think the key is um the uh, the, the understanding between the teachers mm -hmm. staff and the students are we're going to give you 
opportunities galore to do some things that you wouldn't have had access to in your regular school day. But the understanding is you're not going to misbehave and ruin this for everybody else. Right. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. You could either participate with everyone and enjoy and have a good time and have these experiences for a lifetime and evolve from them. Or you could sit and and, and, and mean mug and be mad because everybody else is having fun and you're not. Um, That's the kind of program I like working with. You know, one that um, I know that the staff has my back. But even if they didn't, I don't know. I, I, it's a thing with me, with classroom management. My, my thing with, with young people is I've got a lot of exciting things that I'm here to bring to you. Right. Um, and I don't want you to waste your time or my time because I can leave and take everything I know with me. Right. You will be the ones without. But you have to say it with a respect for them. And I think you can be firm and as long from as they love. know you as long as they know you care that you love them i would not dare suggest that you're not seeing that in the classrooms because a lot of teachers in cms and other schools are that way right however um there's a disconnect somewhere and and i don't blame the parents i don't blame the teachers it's it's a combination of just the village is not the way it used to be period i don't think we still we don't have the same definition of village. Of a vill- yeah, yeah. I think that might be the biggest challenge. We don't have the same definition of what is a village. There, when I was growing up, before you can even get home, the aunts, the mm-hmm. uncles, the neighbors, Miss Jamie, everybody already do Girl, looking out the blinds they waiting, watching they waiting on you mm-hmm. wait till you get home mm-hmm. but it was also whenever there was good news if you received an award if you were acknowledged in school everybody there knew. was that pride so you saw that pride during the whole west charlotte conversation mm-hmm. regarding the championship and even though you had that someone beautiful. that was extremely negative yeah and our system is what it is because you able to just immediately transfer. I say that says more about Providence Day, the fact that you accepted this student, but whatever. What you saw are the West Charlotte alum from going together. back from, heck, forever. From the 60s. I'm, I'm yes. class of 89, and we represented, but my, my mother and my father are both um, WC grads. And when I came, I, 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 I uh, called my mom and I was like, did you hear about, I already know. Right. She'd already gotten the email. And it was like a call, you know, call to the lions to come out and, and everybody, support the it baby didn't matter, Black, <laughs> white, wealthy, working class. There was this surrounding of the athletes a surrounding of all of the students of West Charlotte, of all of those that went before you and that came together and followed you. Not only did they take over at Vance, but when you went on the road to Raleigh, West Charlotte went with you. Yes, yes, yes. And that was something that the community needed to see. And you're right. The question is, how do we keep it going? Because at the same time, we're seeing so much discourse and again because of apathy the killings that we're seeing in the community us killing each other i want to bring up a topic to you and i know i've got some art that goes with it somewhere Ooh, probably the might. roseanne bar when that would work oh i saw that one um i want to speak about i would love to chat about um white privilege and black indifference mm. because I see both sides. Mm-hmm. We always speak about white privilege. It's in our faces. You know, um, Caucasian people know it. Um, people of other races know that it well, exists. Well, I'm sorry. White privilege is not a real thing. So according to what people <laughs> tell me. So I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm totally Take joking. Take your fairy tales people. elsewhere. I'm, talk- I'm totally joking. <laughs> I know. I know. It's about the side eye. you like, right. girl. <laughs> right. But, but seriously, um... You know, we speak on that, but the flip side of of it is African-Americans cannot be indifferent. We can't um, be so focused on our own personal, you know, struggles, whether it's just, you know, paying the bills, raising our kids, Mm -hmm. that we 
turn the other way and say, well, somebody else will handle it. No one else will handle it. We have to handle it. There's certain things we have to address. If you're upset that um, your alma mater has been forced to go to a bigger arena, uh, in the case of West Charlotte. But not by your choice. Not, no. Because as the those who were leading in the championship, they were the ones who were supposed to choose if they wanted to go somewhere right. and where they wanted to go. It was unfair. It was unfair. But it shouldn't take... I don't... I'd like to see us. I'd like to see it not always be reactionary. If the support is consistent, you don't have to be reactionary. Why? I actually wasn't aware that the gym was so small. You know, the entire time I was there at West Charlotte, um, I, I I was I didn't know that the that it was smaller than most gymnasiums. I just remember having a good time. Mm -hmm. I just remember me and my friends going for pep rallies and um, gym jams and whatever assemblies that we had. The size was not an issue, but now it is, and now we know. And once you know, you can't, you, you can no longer afford to pretend like you don't and do yeah. something about it. Um, you don't have to uh, throw a write a check at someone if you don't have money. There are other ways, like I said before, about the platform, right. social media. Um, you get on Facebook and put and post your selfies. Get on Facebook and Twitter and comment about, okay, what are we going to do about this gym now? Right. Are, are, are we, so there we was an announcement. I don't know. I didn't have a chance to get all the details, but there was, I know, Councilmember James Mitchell was with the... Smuggy. <laughs> right, smudgy. That was um he had a chance this morning he was at West Charlotte oh. and Tepper, the new owner of the Carolina Panthers, was doing a presentation over at the school. So I can follow up and get some details oh, on that. what that was. So you have a different conversation, but even at that, so the head of our football team is who reached out to help our West Charlotte basketball players Yeah, when we have an NBA team here. Uh, now, sure I thank Mr. Tepper for what he did because he did not have to do it. Mm -mm. But I still have a question of why is the head of the NFL having to reach? the one to step up to help cover the cost for the road trip to get to Raleigh to cover the buses? It was bittersweet. You know, it was... Um I, I agree with you. I was like happy that they have the opportunity that somebody right. stepped in. But I think most of us echo your, your your issue. Well, why wasn't there money set aside for that already? One, definitely for, because for team that the athletic the athletics department of every school makes money. So you're making money. But even though we know West Charlotte has not had necessarily the access financially that a number of the other schools have from the alumni association we got an nba team here so nba team you i mean these are potentially our future players so i'm like again i appreciate the fact that who stood up did stand up someone did but it still makes me question Where's that money going to? Where, what's happening on the other end? That, exactly, exactly. What's happening on the other end? And how are we showing up for our community? And what is our community? Because I personally just want to be an honorary um, lion. <laughs> My spouse has told me unequivocally that I cannot do the little dub C hand gesture when we out in public because that is only an honor for you West Charlotte well. graduates that other people are not supposed to do it so I get the side eye from my <laughs> spouse when we out and I'm all excited and I want to do the little Dub C logo so I be trying to move my hands and keep them to myself because she won't let me do it because she give me the side eye. It's like a Crip thing you know, right? a Crip and Blood thing you, you, you just can't. You just can't. I'm, I'm right. sorry. See, that's okay. You know? <laughs> That's all right. I mean, I'm still going to give a shout out for West Charlotte because you all made history in our city and you did something that we adults have not figured out how to do right. And that is you brought our city together. 
So the team brought our city together. Whether you had differences or not, that was set aside to show up for our team and to be there. Well, you know, you made me think about something else when we were talking about showing up and putting support and not being reactionary. Um, And I know that we're both inundated with images of what's going on with the future election. You can't turn on CNN, MSNBC, I don't fool with Fox, um, (laughs) and see something about... The oh, I watch Democrats. Gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I watch Fox because that's where they got the black shows. They knew what they was doing. <laughs> I gotta ask. What my, do you my, think my, about my them bringing in um, a girl? Who? Oh. Um, Donna Brazil. I think that um, I think it's gonna work against them. I will tune in at least once or twice to see what she's but got. But you to know, say. Fox is good for black nights. You know, they always do that when ratings one. go down. They'll throw out a couple of Stacey Dash <laughs> TV. They'll throw out a couple of different things for, and I was looking for it. There's the bar oh, character yeah. that you was talking about. <laughs> so when you think about how media, again, who controls it? Who? Where's the money coming from on the backside? When we look at across the nation, whether it's West Charlotte, whether it's media, whether it's Banking, who are the ones that's really controlling policy, controlling the development, controlling the dollars? There are very few times that we're in room, which is one of the reasons why I am so excited about this opportunity and the fact that there is a square media network. You have an African-American male who is building his own media network company who is utilizing social media who has shows currently on his network so i am one of three shows this unapologetically black you have deuce lux you have his show the project with steve rutherford and he's growing the network so he's interviewing and talking to people to identify others that have a message to get out there and to be at the ground floor of something like this changes the whole conversation because we wouldn't be able to have this conversation to talk about how your art addresses politics how bullying is impacting communities of color whether you are black or latino or muslim how bullying is impacting you without having a specific slant to it if we did not have this space see that's why i got so excited i mean i have um only had one opportunity to work with steve rutherford many many years ago um so when i heard about rutherford media that excited me. And then the opportunity to talk with you um, took it to another level. It's like, okay, this is just all good. All good <laughs> things. Nothing bad um, to um, um, hear. But, um, you know, there was so much that I wanted to tackle. And I was like, okay, you know, what issues do we bring up? There was something that you just mentioned about um, when we were talking about the bullying mm-hmm. and the different races. Um something that I, I wanted to to suggest with my art there's the work I get paid for right um, I work with three different agencies um, your event source um, about faces entertainment um, and um, oh god he's gonna kill me forgetting uh, forgetting the other company um, okay he's probably not watching okay <laughs> okay so let's put a pin right there so because there's someone out there that might be a up and coming character artists. How did you find agencies? How do you find an agent? Um, again, back to social media. I've got to tell you, I found About Faces Entertainment through Facebook. They saw my work um, and they reached out to me. Mm. And they've kept me working for, I mean, consistently for 10 years. Wow. It's good money, I'll be very honest. Um, and I don't complain. Whenever I have a diva moment because I've been out in the hot sun, I remind myself how much I'm getting paid an hour to basically draw funny faces of people. What's the complaint about? There's somebody cleaning a toilet and, and hating it. 
you know so and we also have people who are cleaning the toilet and happy about it because they own that business okay okay exactly let's let's give let's give a shout out to all the small business owners (laughs) but let's give a shout out because you are a small business owner which is one of the other reasons why I was so glad that you had it in your schedule the time for us to have this conversation because a lot of people don't think about the business aspect of it and part of that business aspect is how do you find an agent so you found one because actually they found you they found me now your event source um oh gosh um honestly a lot of things have come to me and god be the glory through word of mouth okay um back in the you know the stone ages i had a yellow pages ad and um, oh, millennials don't people, know anything about young that. Young people, you would never know about the Yellow Pages. Yeah, <laughs> about those late night at Kinko's, printing out flyers and that whole thing. But, you know, now, you know, we've got websites and blog posts um, and social media. Um, Instagram can be your website to, to push your work. Yes. Um, but um, there's only one other African female in this area, the young lady by the name of Livonia Parks. For a while, it was just me. And I'm not complaining because I love what I do. But even now at my age, there's still moments where I feel like people are wanting me to have to prove myself. And that gets on my nerves because, um, not to brag, but I look at my CV and I mean everything from like, you know, gallery shows that I've done over the years, um, public art installations that I've been a part of, like Chairs on Parade when we had that here in Charlotte, mm-hmm. the celebrities that I look at that I work with. And I'm, I'm really proud of some of those things that I've done. And yet for some people, they see the race, they see the gender. Right. And they want and they want me to, to, to prove myself. Mm-hmm. And or they want to discount your work. Yeah, and and that's <laughs> but here's the difference. Black woman, you know your worth. And you are in a position where you can walk away and, I and do. say, "You know what? This, you know, thank you for the opportunity to meet. This is I don't think this is a good fit for either one of us." And I'm nice about it. I'm I'm diplomatic, but I got to tell you, I get a little bit of joy whenever somebody has decided that they don't want to pay my rate mm-hmm. and then they go get someone else and then on a few occasions they've contacted me like oh my god i used this person and they did this and i was like you get what you pay for exactly you know i don't know what to tell you it's not about me being a diva it's about i have worked very hard to Mm -hmm. get to just here and i'm not done yet i've still got many miles left on my journey right but for where i am currently um you're not going to play me like i'm some college student right those days are over respect the fact that you're a business woman respect the fact that you have put years into your art into your craft don't always try to look for a hookup or discount or think that you don't know your value and know your worth because you do and and let me be fair most of the time people approach me to be honest with you with i'm not sure if i can afford you they already assume and i feel like i need to put that out there that I've got I've had wonderful clients and I would say 90 percent of people that approach me it is respectful but I mean because that's how I approach it I'm like um so Lena just to get an idea let's have a real conversation because here's the budget that I have but I want to be respectful of your art respectful of your craft is this something we can do if not I completely respect that I understand it because, again, you put years and time into your skill, into your craft, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, and I'm quite sure they are thinking of it the same way. They're not trying, they don't want to come off disrespectful by trying to low go lowball, mm-hmm. but they're being honest on the front end and say, Here's the budget that I have, but I would love to have your service. And honestly, a lot of times I can be very flexible. As long as you meet my rate, I'll give you 150, 200 percent. There's, you know, the deal that we've agreed to. And if I'm loving the project and, you know, I'm, it, it's, it's up to me to decide if I want to put a little bit more into it. But that's my choice. But at right. least meet this rate. My advice for young people wanting to get into this, um, 
it is important to go to school. Okay. I did not learn cartooning in Winston-Salem State University. Um, I was trained as a fine art major. Um, so mainly it was about learning from the great masters as well as the African-American masters. Mm. Um, it was about learning color theory um, and design, all that boring stuff. But the cartooning is something I taught myself. Really? Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute. As a proud graduate of HBCU, you learn the foundational skills. How do you transition that to teaching yourself character art? Uh, let's see. I was uh, 18 years old. No, I was 17. And my uncle had a restaurant called McDonald's Cafeteria off of Bates Ford Road. Girl, don't play. Yeah, I um, mean some McDonald's cafeteria. Again, and I, things young people would never have any idea about. I miss my uncle, but I've got to bring up this story because I will remain forever grateful. I just asked him because I had been working for the restaurant since I was 12 years old, like rolling silverware. The whole family worked at the restaurant, mm -hmm. and I was like, Uncle John, can I just set up and sell my cartoons in the lobby? I was charging like three dollars. And he let me do it. That gave me the confidence. That gave me, um, well, obviously the, the money because it was, it was really popular. There right. were people who actually came looking for me. And I had a chance to meet all types of, like, um, you know, uh, how do I say this? Um, I'm going to say in Charlotte VIPs. Okay. Um, well, you know, everybody Harvey went, Gantz, to, everybody went to McDonald's. Everybody yes. went to McDonald's. Everybody, we went even to a couple of celebrities. Right. They came through from time to time. Um, and it was that first start that I will remain forever grateful. From there, I was drawing on campus. Um, I was doing caricatures at Haynes Mall in Winston-Salem mm -hmm. um, in front of the deck, the walls. Um, and they let me set up for free. And wow. I just walked up and showed them my portfolio and was like, can I set up here? Um, I remember a couple of times when I was just so broke. <laughs> the worst being the time that I went to a Burger King and was like, I don't have any food in my, at like an apartment off campus. And they just let me set up and draw. You know, wow. of course I don't have to do that anymore. But it right, taught me but that. They also, but also people out there need to know that you got to put some work into this. Yeah. Everything just doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's one of the other disconnects is somewhere in mm -hmm. over the years, we stop some some young people, like a lot of our millennials, are already entrepreneurs, oh, business yeah. owners. Just like I say with Moesha, with Moesha's world, she's 12 years old. She's already a businesswoman, an I'm entrepreneur. But you also have some that feel like, I'm here. I've arrived. Give me everything you got. expectations. And they don't realize that, no, what they see, what we're looking at today, what those who follow you have seen that was years of work and honing your skill to get there. It takes years to be an overnight success often. Exactly. Now, some people do luck into it, and that's their blessing. That's their favor, and I won't knock their hustle. But for a lot of us, we have to put in the time. Um, it was Nick Lewis saying to me just the other day, he said, we need to stop saying grind. Yes. Have you heard his He talked that? about that when he was here. Shout out to Nick Lewis, our local comedian extraordinaire. He was on the last episode of Unapologetically Black. He joined me and Robert Dawkins. That was a good one. He was like, black folks need to stop saying grind. We don't grind. Right. And he was right. It's about the hustle. You know, um, and then I thought about the imagery of grinding, like you grind coffee. Right. Um, and I said, okay, whether you consider a matter of semantics or just, you know, but for me, I look at it as the words that come out your mouth, you speak life into them. Yes. So if I look at it as I've got a vision, if I'm grinding, then that means that's just me every day, like a workhorse, just out there, just not going anywhere. Right. Putting in work now. Right. But not going anywhere. But if, not seeing any forward movement. Exactly. And, and that's never been my plan. For me, I've got a vision map at home. Mm -hmm. um, I won't talk about some other projects I'm working on. I'm very excited about one that's an animation project. And I can't tell you the celebrities that are involved. But when he called me on the I phone. I feel like this, like, with the military. Like, 
all this secrecy. Like that's just like <laughs> cruel to just drop a little bit. See, do y'all feel that? Y'all y'all gonna tell us later if you feel that that it feels like, hey, you just gonna tease us like that? But go ahead, and don't let your left Te- hand know what your right hand's doing. Well, that is true. That is very true. So tell us a little. What can you share? Um, it involves Netflix. Nice. And this is what I'm just I've saying. Can I get my to. autograph ahead of time? Can I, can I get my autograph? So when you blow up, Sis. when you blow up, because God's already God's laid His plan out a long time ago. Thank you. So it's just a matter of you stepping into it. So God's already laid out the plan. Our fear keeps us from stepping into the greatness that God has for us. We'll get in our own heads and start get doubting and way. questioning when God's already laid the path. So whatever it's going to be, I'm just saying, can I get my autograph on the front of you? Well, I'm guilty that. of that, too, and that needs to be pointed out. I don't want to sit here and paint a picture of someone um, figuratively <laughs> um, that has it all together. Right. Because I don't. Um, there are things that I feel really happy about that are in my wheelhouse and that I've worked hard for and made happen. And then there are the opportunities that I've messed up. Okay. And I think about them often, replaying them in my head. Here's something I want to share that I think needs to be said. Um, I was telling Amy Georges about the authors of Pigtails. Mm-hmm. And I said, I did that book for them seven years ago. They just It just came out. And she was like, wow, like, why so long? Sometimes it's in the season. Right. And I thought about so many things that I wanted for myself at a younger age that didn't happen. I once tried to work with J. Anthony Brown mm-hmm. when he was doing the Chime Joyner Morning Show. And I lost his card. He used another cartoonist. And I beat myself up about it. Years later, it came back full circle through Twitter through some work and he came to me this time. Wow. Um, I remember once wanting to work with Ashley Stewart Mm -hmm. and sending them a presentation. They ignored it. Years later, I started working with Sharon Quinn and Gwen DeVoe with Full Figure Fashion Week and that brought me directly to Ashley Stewart. This time, again, they came to me. Right. We want you to do our event in in Brooklyn when we have the Finding Ashley event. Um, I'm not bragging. I want it to be mentioned that there's so many people who give up. Right. It didn't happen right then and there. And yes. they start doubting themselves. And we all doubt ourselves. Right. But there's there needs to be an understanding that sometimes, as cliche as it may sound, it's the season. Exactly. And recognizing that. And I think there are people out there that needed to hear that. To hear that it wasn't some easy Role Mm-mm. that it took some times, it took some stumbles, it took some mistakes, it took recognizing that, oh man, I really messed that up, and then you. trusting the fact that okay, I'm gonna learn from this lesson. And then when you learn from that lesson, it came back full circle. But the difference they is, they better sometimes, exactly because they came to you, they saw your work, so maybe. That first time wasn't the time. That was just the preparation to get you ready for when you really have access and opportunity. And I also like to mention this, too, on the heels of that. There will be crooks. Speak on it. Speak on it. Tell some truth. Speak on it. Tell some truth. I was about to name names, but I'm not. Wouldn't be right. Okay. See, (laughs) so I'm going to say there. I challenge that theory and that thought of it wouldn't be right to name names for the simple fact that people take advantage of people because people didn't warn people. You're right. So when and this idea that we have in communities, and again, not just in the black community, I've seen in the Latino community, I've seen it in the Caribbean community, I've seen in the African community where you have someone that's out there that's hurting their community. But they've been deemed a leader by other people. But they've stolen, they've misinformed, right. they've, utilized, they've utilized their status to hurt other people. But because we don't want to talk about it, because what we always say, oh, we're not going to talk about that. Stitches. That, and we don't want to um, shit We don't want to show our dirty laundry. Yeah. We don't want to talk about it in front of the other people. But what we do then, go back to when we were in middle school. So I was a school patrol. 
I know you can see that. I'm I can. so proud. <laughs> had my little orange. I had my little orange little um, thing on. I was a proud little school patrol. So that whole idea of see something, say something. You're right. You, you say you're anti-bullying, but you condone the bully's habits. So, and I'm not saying that specifically no, for you. you. I, feel you. I, feel I you. just that's one of my pet peeves in our community where when we allow people to give misinformation and keep hurting people, and we don't speak up when we know about it. So, this man is in the White House during the presidential campaigning. Instead of people speaking to it as if y'all don't wake up and pay attention, this crook going to be in the White House. And here are all the ways that we're telling he's a crook, that he files bankruptcy religiously, that he can't even get a loan within from a bank within the United States of America, that none of his business acumen that he claims is actually there. It, there's no there there. Everybody in New York in the business community knew it. Nobody wanted to talk about it because they say, you know what, people are smart enough to see through that. You well, collectively, recently. we're not. So, but when, yet, all those people knew these things. They knew very specific business, business dealings. Yeah. Those who were hurt by him, specifically through business dealings, kept it to themselves instead of telling it so why would i not warn you if i know that somebody is has you abused you like we have i'm working with someone now because we have refugee students and immigrant students that are both at unc and central piedmont who were completely taken advantage of financially by patrice ognoto now i've worked with patrice 15 years ago, the person that I met back then is not the person that I've learned about the last 10, 15 years. But I keep hearing these stories. I keep hearing these examples. But then I have real live people who are impacted. So students who came over here who paid money, whose money was supposed to be paid for their education, who are not going to be able to graduate because they have outstanding balances. We as a community allowed this to happen. Every time we stayed silent, right. he was able to get access to another young, vulnerable student who's just looking for an opportunity. Thank you. In business, every time you have a new entrepreneur, a new business owner that's getting out there, they don't know where to start. So a lot of it is also word of mouth. If the wrong mouth gives the wrong word they're going to be in a position where that position could make or break them having a successful business here's what i'll say and i'm gonna keep it real completely a hundred this was my experience and i learned a lot from it and i will say this lessons keep coming back till they get learned um always sign a contract okay do not be lazy in business because you think somebody will do their part and they'll take care of it don't assume because they're older mm -hmm. don't assume because they're more fluent they have more money or more um access to things or they're more well known you cover you cya yes i was a um a partaker of new life fellowship church with john p key and he came to me about doing a children's book called little rufus now, those of us, I mean, those people who live in Charlotte may have heard of Lil Rufus. Those who know my work know when they see Lil Rufus where their work came from. Now, ask me if my name is associated with the book. So, but that was a lesson learned. It was a lesson learned because I thought, well, he's a world-renowned recording star. Um, he's a, a, a beloved pastor, a pastor, my pastor at the time. Surely, you know, things will get taken care of. Um, and I actually did have an invoice, but, you know, I was just so lured into all the attention I was getting from everybody knowing that I was creating this book. And I fell for it hook, line, and sinker. I'll never forget the moment when I realized what was really going on. I was being used as a ghost artist. He took the drawings I did and basically traced and did his own version. So technically, he was the artist, but he, just like a ghost writer, you use my work and then you redraw it wow. so you now I get to say that about. you did it but i still have the originals and i still have the book now wow. other people may have had good experiences with pastor key 
but that one was a bad one for me. I've heard others similar to my story. And that was another thing that I want to challenge people to do. When you hear repeated stories of people doing bad business, you're now accountable. I cannot lie to myself and pretend that I wasn't warned. Okay. The red signs were there. But you thought you were different. I thought I was different. I and we like, all had those conversations. Steve and I had Not that me. conversation from the, from the beginning. We had that same conversation because I was like, okay, so what does this look like? Because this right here is completely new. I knew that it would, I was like, you know what? I need to be on radio because I love being on television <laughs> debating when I get to be on Flashpoint. And I love talking politics and debating, doing all that. And I also hear all of these horror stories and things that happen. So he and I had that conversation. I'm like, okay, so do we need to have a contract? What does this look like? If you blow up, what happens to me? Do you get to take the show? Is it my show? What, how does this work out? So, yes, you have to ask those questions. And for me, it was because of making mistakes when I was younger. There was a online. That was in my 20s when that happened. Right, and, and that's I, it. So yeah, I, mean, I got like, some money, but... I didn't get the recognition. Right. And that's what I wanted more because the money came in. It wasn't even that much money. So, and that's, but that's that lesson learned because in, when in our 20s, so hopefully this will help some people to avoid not recognizing that we're all human. Right. Recognizing that there are going to be times where we're going to hurt people and there are going to be times where we're going to be hurt by people. Agreed. Because as humans, we have free will. And when we know better, hopefully we do better. My greatest ask of the universe, of God, of my higher power is when it is time for my judgment day and that feather is laid on the scales that my good outweigh my bad. Yes. And hopefully I have truly done more good in my life than pain that I have caused. But I remember... There was, and now for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of it. I'm mad because I can't remember the name of it. But there was an online designer, a young sister. She had just started out. She was really working on plus-size clothing. And, of course, the um, clothes were a little more expensive on the front end. But, you know, that's because we don't have the mass production and everything. Was it Monique C? Thank you. Monique C. Wow. So, I have the email from way back when, from where we were talking, and I gave a specific suggestion on jumpsuits. Because those, remember when she first came out, yeah. all she did was dresses. Yeah. So, because you remember she mm-hmm. had the convertible dresses mm-hmm. and all of Now she's gone. I think she's focusing on swimwear. But we had conversations about jumpsuits. Cool. I ain't hear anything. Nothing. Nothing. I, mind you, I have, because um, first of all, I'm a pack rat, so I keep everything. So I have the email file. <laughs> yeah. I sent the recommendation. I ain't hear nothing from her. Like, we were <laughs> in correspondence quite often. Eight months to a year later is when the first jumpsuit came out. I went back to my email. I shot an email with a picture of the jumpsuit. I was like, so is this based off of our conversations? Mm-hmm. So that was a hard lesson for me because for me, it wasn't about design. It wasn't about money. So it was about the fact that as a consumer, I knew the things that I wanted to have. And it was about the fact that I'm a very relational person. I'm not a transactional person. And we're in a very transactional society. Yeah. And I am really a relational person more than anything else. Same so here. I truly believe that. I have to work at that, that as well. That right. your word is your bond and I'm a trust the process i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give you full credit until you give me a reason not to i don't automatically just dislike anybody you gave me a reason for me not to fool with you we have that in common (laughs) so when i think of that i'm like man that hurt me that really hurt my feelings for the simple fact that i was like wait a minute wow this is how you do not only your consumers but the people that promote you and then because you see now social media of course that was at the beginning the of social media I, of. I threw her name out of social media was still at the beginning back then here's the thing just like i do now when i'm taking pictures and i promote who's the artist who's the designer all of that for whatever it is you use that a lot because one i believe in giving credit what credits do I believe in supporting small business. I believe in supporting minority business. So I'm like, this isn't mine. 
I my if I have a platform, whatever that platform is, I want to highlight others so that people know because I want your business to be successful. This is one of the things that I like and respect and that's why I go hard for you. The things that people don't know that I know. And it's beyond it's not about me being biased because, you know, we have an evolving friendship. Right. It's because I respect your integrity. And I see so many people who, and usually it's in a clumsy way, they don't give attention and they don't give the credit to people who put the work in. Right. And that frustrates me for black entrepreneurs, um, black creatives, period. You work so hard and all it takes is just take a moment to shout that person out. That's it. I did some work for a young woman the other day and um, she paid me good money for it. But when she posted on Facebook, she did not mention I did the artwork. It wasn't going to kill me that people didn't know that I did it. But it's just something I would naturally do. If I use your services, I'm mentioning that it came from this person. Exactly. Because that's just an automatic for some people. But for others, it is... Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes it's ignorance. It's, it's not even a thought. Sometimes it's an, and I think it's that piece where, I mean, and I've realized, I don't even think it's about, you're not that important. You weren't even a thought to them when they were doing yeah, it. That's what hurts. And that's what really hurts yeah. is the fact that you weren't even, like we spent time doing whatever this was that we were doing mm-hmm. and created this. And the end result is I go out like, when Christian Sharano had to create this yeah. amazing dress. That's a great example. Of- and the fact that she had to go because, uh, first of all, you're That's not why big. I do it. First of all, you ain't big. So I don't know what the heck she was talking about when she couldn't find people to um, like, what, dress her. Size, 10 or 12. Right. I'm like, what the hell are you and talking about? But whatever. Too, went, went, went right. <laughs> but she couldn't find a designer that would dress her. So it's one of the hottest gave- Canadians in the country at that time. And you're right. And couldn't but find she anybody. gave credit where credit was due. We Imagine if she walked that runway and said, "Oh, it's nothing." Like yeah. just give, just acknowledge. Now there'll be times where you'll forget, but social media, you can always go out. Oops, I forgot to uh, highlight. So every time, anytime you see me in anything African inspired, Paul Andre Boutique. Thank yep, you, Paul Andre. Yeah, yep, yep. If you like this, this was off the rack. I know we have different conversations, different levels of wealth, like wealth, real, like real wealth, old school wealth, generational wealth. They don't tell you where nothing came from. Don't ask them about how much money anything costs. They don't even want to know your name, tell you the truth. You don't introduce yourself. That's a whole different target. But when people ask me, I'm like, um, Paul Andre Boutique off of Roswell's Fair, right off the of trade. Oh, no, this came off the rack. Give he props. has stuff in the shop. Yeah, about the shop. And if you don't see something that you like in there, he'll make it. I'm like, that's what we're supposed to do. Like with Vicente Wines, I got a stack of cards. So when we talk, when I'm out and about and people talking about, oh, you like wine? You know, there's a new um, winery here in Charlotte. African-American female started it. Here's the card. That's Every time all, I go uh, somewhere, less take your pictures. 30 seconds. That's it. Take a picture, post it. Hey, see this. The young sister that opened up the juice bar. Off of South End. Hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Another black-owned business. Congratulations. Queen's Cup. Queen's Coffee Cafe. Off of Parkwood. Mm -hmm. Hey, black-owned coffee shop. Small business. So you know, it's out here. It doesn't take much. It hurts when people don't acknowledge. When you show up, the other side of that, what hurts more is when we don't educate each other. So today, what you allow for me is for us to educate people and hopefully encourage people on following your dream and yeah. knowing your dream might be redirected. You went to school for one thing, but there was a passion that started when you were 12 that found its way back and you realized, yes, I need this education, but God put this gift in me, so I need to utilize it. Well, actually, not to correct you, but honestly, I've wanted to be a cartoonist since I was a little girl. So, okay. Um, it's just that um, they didn't offer commercial art. 
I just kind of had to take fine so art. So you took fine art because yes. they didn't offer it commercial art at that time. However, it's still part of the foundation. Okay. I needed to learn how to do figure drawing. Okay. I needed to learn how to sculpt. I needed to know color theory. All those things were very important, and they've they've come full circle. I've okay. been able to utilize them, but you know the the bread and butter, the cash cow, will always be the cartooning. Um, and um, yeah, the thing about following dreams, I I love that you pointed that out because um, something about creative fields, there's this myth that people have that um, there's only a few slots available mm. they treat it like winning the lottery right and if you don't reach a certain place by a certain age then they will write it off i mean i could name you plenty of people who um octavia spencer who won an oscar yes. got a late start as an actress i mean she's probably right. been acting for years right I, I remember her in quite a few movies but she, her star didn't take off until years later mm -hmm. um, because samuel L. jackson yeah, yeah. We knew about them from like the, like the 40 Acres and the Mule productions. But the rest of Hollywood didn't know about them until and years And even that, later. He, was, uh, he was not considered he the was prime kind of, age. Yeah, he was a little older. Right. He wasn't considered the prime age when he first got his big break. His first initial break was Spike Lee. And had been at it for years. A Yale School of Drama, right? Him and Angela Bassett. That's where, well, you know, him and uh, Paulina. Uh, that's Denzel. Okay, uh, thank you. Because yeah. I ain't trying to mix up um, marriages here, so forgive me on that. I feel a joke. Because Paulina <laughs> is um, Denzel's <laughs> wife, and she holds on to that. But <laughs> we started a little bit late. We are now looking at what are we looking at? Um, Kim Kardashian. Almost. <laughs> that's what that was. Oh my God! I totally <laughs> did not realize. I am not a I'm not a Kardashian watcher. Her, the booty alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of injections and all of that. So I'm not a fan. I, I wouldn't have guessed it just because I don't know who they are. Now, I, um, here's the thing. I will now, not I do discriminate. Keep, I do keep up with Pirates of the Caribbean because I'm a sci-fi <laughs> person. So I do know Johnny Depp. Oh, that's an old one, too. I remember when I did that. <laughs> so, but when we think about this, I just wanted to let it run through one more time for people to Thank see you. Your art. And if people wanted to contact you, if they wanted to hire you, how would they do that? Um, I, I have a new website that I'm doing. Um, it's under construction, and um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, but you can find me. Actually, you can Google my name. Okay. And, tell people um, what that is. Uh, see, that would be Lena J. And you can find me. Uh, L-E-N-A. L-E-N-A-J, The Art of Lena J. You can also find me through uh, my full government name. Oh. Lena Hopkins Jackson. Wow. So between those two ways, um, through Le Lena J or, and then there's my social media. But the best way is just to Google it, um, and my information will come up. Um, those looking for um, classes, I'll be teaching um, a painting class this summer with Lorian Academy. Oh, where's that? Uh, um, that is off of, believe it or not, it's called Artsy Avenue. Okay. <laughs> and it's off of Freedom and Allegheny. Okay. And in my district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and um, we start in June. Okay. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, this so has been wonderful. I appreciate your openness, your Thank willingness you. to share not only the success, but the challenges along the way and the fact that you did not give up, that you kept following your dream. I appreciate the fact that you shared that with us. Is there any closing remarks that you want to share? Oh, wow. Let's see. Closing remarks. Um, or anything you want the people to know. Um, do your journey. Do your journey. And with that, I thank you for tuning in to Square Media Network. I want to make sure that you know that you have opportunities to stay in tune. We have Deuce Lux podcast show with Lux Lisbon as well as Katie Lux. 
You have Unapologetically Black. We are the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month, 7 p.m. And, of course, you have The Project with Steve Rutherford. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful week.